I think in many ways all of that came to an end uh, under John Paul II uh, in the sense that if there were any doubt uh, that Opus Dei had the official approval uh, of the leadership of the Roman Catholic Church, that certainly was resolved uh, under John Paul. He uh, created Opus Dei as a personal prelature, giving them a very special status under church law that no one else enjoys uh, in 1982. He beatified uh, Jose Maria Escrivá, the founder, in uh, 1992, and then canonized him in 2002. In other words, there was a major gesture of papal support and favor uh, under, at a rhythm of once every 10 years uh, under John Paul II. No other organization could point to that kind of clear public endorsement. Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel, welcome back to another Opus Dei deep dive video. I think the quote that I put at the beginning of this really does a good job of hinting at just how huge this whole thing is becoming. It is so much deeper than I originally thought and it quite literally goes all the way to the top. The more I dig, the more information I am finding. It is all out there if you know where to look and I have enough now to make quite a few videos for quite some time. So if that is something that you are interested in and you've kind of just been standing on the sidelines up till now, I highly encourage you to please subscribe and turn on notifications so that you will know when those future videos come out. I fully intend to follow this rabbit hole down to the very bottom, wherever that may be and wherever that may lead. Today we're going to be talking about Opus Dei's financials, the affiliations and ties the organization has, and what I think that information can tell us about Opus Dei's intentions. I believe it can tell us everything that we need to know. The numbers do not lie, it is all laid out in black and white, and it is very, very simple. There is a lot to go through, and I think the financial stuff may be the biggest side of what makes this organization tick. And so what I'm going to be going over in this video is just merely scratching the surface of everything that there is to talk about. This will not be the last time that we're talking about Opus Dei's financials, especially because they don't just exist within the Vatican. They have fingers and tendrils out everywhere and I want to focus primarily on the Vatican link today because that's something I've been interested in for a really long time but there's plenty more to go over and I anticipate that we'll be coming back to it in the not too distant future. So to begin to dive in I want to circle back to something that I have said in my last couple of videos which if you haven't seen you definitely need to but that is Opus Dei's attention to academia and their focus on people in the high school to college age and their intention to recruit and bring those people in. Now you may be asking yourself, what does this have to do with the Vatican? Well, just wait because everything is connected. This thing is one big messy tangled ball of yarn and when you start to pull on one thread, a bunch of other things come falling out. So just wait because it does all come full circle. But I have some numbers here that I think are very indicative of just how influential Opus Dei is worldwide. I got these from an article called Opus Dei's Empire in the United States and I will link it down below if you want to go and check it out. You can do that in your own time. Everything that I use to research this video will be down below. But these are either Opus Dei funded, run, or sponsored universities, companies, schools, etc, etc. And there are 487 universities and high schools, 52 radio and TV stations, 694 publications, 38 news and publicity agencies, and 12 film and distribution companies. The author of the article notes that these numbers are a bit outdated now, but I have no reason to believe, given everything that I know, that these numbers are any smaller today. If anything, I'm sure they have probably grown, and it just goes to show worldwide where all Opus Dei is. I mean, they are literally in everything that has to do with information and education, which should kind of be a little bit chilling to you, and if it isn't, then just wait because it will be. There is also the fact that Opus Dei likes to position themselves in strategic locations to very influential schools. They like to put either student residences or numerary centers very close to these schools, and particularly the very well-to-do ones such as MIT, Notre Dame, UCLA, Harvard, Princeton, Brown, and Stanford. The list goes on and on. You can access the whole thing in the article. But this just shows to me a very concentrated effort on the part of Opus Dei to target people who are either highly educated or extremely well connected and wealthy and bring them into the Opus Dei fold because more people with money equals more money for Opus Dei. And that is honestly what this whole thing is about. 
it's about the money. Conversely, and I just wanted to throw this in because I think this just speaks volumes of the character of Opus Dei as an organization, there was a Lexington College in Chicago that was the only women's hospitality institution for the U.S. for the economically challenged, and it was known to be a recruiting ground for numerary assistants. And if you recall from my last video, the numerary assistants are basically the indentured servants for everyone else in Opus Dei. They cook and clean the centers, they wipe the asses of the numeraries, they do literally everything for very little in return and often under pretty abysmal conditions and treatment. And this just reinforces, in my mind, the fact that Opus Dei is only interested in you if you have something to give them. They're only interested in you if you have money or influence of some sort. If you're poor, they don't care for you unless you're going to clean their floors. Interestingly enough, I looked up Lexington College before I filmed this video and it actually closed in 2014. And try as I might, I wasn't able to find an explanation for why it closed, just that it is no longer in existence. I'm not too bummed out about the fact that it's closed down considering the fact that Opus Dei went there to recruit numerary assistants, but I'm sure they just turned their attentions elsewhere. Unfortunately, there is no shortage of economically challenged people in the world or in this country. Now, getting into some bigger players, bigger numbers now, there are also foundations in almost all major U.S. cities which are responsible for the care and maintenance of Opus Dei centers. And you can view these foundations, particularly the grant-making foundations, and their assets on GuideStar. And I have a few of them listed here along with their monetary value. You. And these are pretty big numbers. There is the Woodlawn Foundation, which is 15 million, the Clover Foundation, 27 million, the Association for Cultural Interchange, 67 million, and the National Center Foundation, 67 million. And most of these foundations collect and redistribute and funnel funds back into Opus Dei. Uh, with the exception of the National Center Foundation, which purely supports operations at the Opus Dei Headquarters building in New York City, which, if you don't recall, is that gigantic skyscraper that they have in New York City, where they do whatever it is that they do, $67 million to keep that place up and running. Numeraries and numerary assistants are not permitted to collect or keep any money for themselves. Every little bit that they get, with the exception of what they absolutely need to provide themselves the bare essentials, goes back into the center where they live. And if they ever leave the organization, I should say if and when they leave, they are entitled to not one red cent of anything that they made while they were there. So because of that, Opus Dei is able to keep their labor costs really, really low. They basically just rely on the free labor of their members. And based off of those numbers that we just went over, we can assume that that Opus Dei is quite well to do, has plenty of money to work with, but it's pretty much impossible to come up with a single figure for the organization's overall net worth. They really don't keep coordinated, well-documented records. They basically leave that up to the individual centers, and you can find some information on GuideStar and on IRS 999 forms, but overall there is no one single number that you can find, and I think that they do that on purpose. I think that they don't want to keep well-coordinated, organized records. I don't think they want people to be able to figure out how much they're worth, because I would bet that it is probably significant more than any of us have speculated at and it is within their best interest to keep that information secret and close to their chest. Because of the fact that they have all that money and they attract influential, educated people, they have been able to position themselves next to very key players in the civil and, of course, religious world. And I want to come back at some point down the line to the civil side of things because it is fascinating, but like I said, we're mainly going to be focusing on that religious, the Vatican Opus Dei link. Now, when I first began researching all of this, my understanding and belief of why that relationship between the Vatican and Opus Dei existed was very different. I kind of thought that Opus Dei did some kind of of hostile takeover and moved in on the Vatican and took what they wanted because I was giving the Vatican the benefit of the doubt which I should have known better but that is neither here nor there based off of everything that I have read now I do not believe that that is the case whatsoever I believe that there there is a give and give relationship in which both parties benefit and I have information that I think reinforces that but one explanation for 
why that relationship exists to begin with, and I think that this is the most likely explanation, is the fact that over the last several decades, the Catholic Church has slowly been losing members. There just are not as many people going to church now as there were 20 or 30 years ago. In addition to that, within the last several years, the Catholic Church has begun to accrue some pretty hefty legal fees to the tune of $3 billion in legal costs and settlements to the church's victims of sex abuse. So in my mind, I'm thinking that because the Vatican has kind of condoned Opus Dei for quite some time, if you heard that little sound bite at the beginning of this video from that interview with John Allen, they have given Opus Dei the green light for quite some time since well before John Paul II. I'm thinking that the Catholic Church probably saw all of this coming. They saw the fact that people were going to start leaving and they saw the fact that their chickens were going to be coming home to roost. They realized that there wasn't going to be as much financial support from the congregation because there weren't going to be as many people in the churches and they also realized that they were going to have to pay up for their sins and they thought we need to figure something out now before this gets really really bad or we're going to be in a pretty serious pickle. What other organization out there also has a whole bunch of money and would love to be positioned in a primo spot in the Vatican? Opus Dei. And so I think the Vatican went to Opus Dei and said, hey, you scratch our back, we'll scratch yours. You come help us take care of our messes and we will give you positions of power and prestige in the Vatican. And Opus Dei said, awesome, sounds good, we're on our way over. And it's basically all been history since then. Now, why do I think all of that, you might be asking yourself? Well, we're gonna go over that information. So Pope Francis established the Secretariat of the Economy in 2014, and he appointed Australian Cardinal George Pell as its head. And if you were paying attention to global religious news a while ago, you might recognize that name because Pell had his moment of fame back a little while ago when he went through a little scandal and actually ended up stepping down from this position and spent a little bit of time in jail to boot before everything was acquitted and I couldn't find out any information on whether or not he returned to that position I could do a whole separate video on that guy because he is a piece of work. But at any rate, after that appointment, Pell invited Opus Dei to establish themselves in Melbourne and Sydney. And he essentially became the de facto manager of the Vatican because he controlled the purse strings. He seemingly had a very close relationship with Opus Dei, although I wasn't able to determine whether or not he was actually a member himself. He obviously held them in high esteem and they him. He invited them to establish them themselves in two major Australian cities to the detriment of pre-existing Catholic groups and organizations. There's also this really interesting little factoid that I read in this article called Opus Dei Influence Rises to the Top in the Vatican, and it says a year after a Cardinal George Mario Bergoglio's elevation as head of the church and his many appointments, three cardinals have emerged as the most powerful in this papacy, all have close ties to Opus Dei, two now control all Vatican finance. Pope Francis also created a new council for the economy and only those with close ties to Opus Dei have advanced in power. And the council was coordinated by Cardinal Reinhard Marx, who was the invited speaker for 300 guests of Opus Dei at an event in Germany. In addition to that, Opus Dei allegedly has a lot of power in the German financial capital of Frankfurt, and there is evidence to suggest that the Vatican's finances were transferred to Opus Dei banking groups. So all of this is to say, there was no hostile takeover of any sort. The Vatican wants Opus Dei there. Opus Dei wants to be there. It's a beneficial relationship for all parties involved, given everything that has happened within the Roman Catholic Church in the last few years. And they probably saw all this coming, like I said, and realized that they needed to get some things in place so that when that happened, they would not be destroyed by their bad behavior and mistakes. The fact that Opus Dei has banks, banking systems is just kind of bizarre to me. It really blew my mind when I stumbled across that fact, but this kind of brings us back to education just like I said it would. Because of the likelihood that one of Opus Dei's largest financial institutions is Banco Santander in Spain. And it is the largest bank in the Eurozone by market value and one of the largest banks in the world in terms of market capitalization. Big money, big players, 
Opus Dei at the center of it. Santander funds Opus Dei schools. And there's a quote from a Santander company official that says, Santander's interest in higher education is a deep interest long term because we understand that at the university are studying the leaders who will run the country in the future. The story literally writes itself, but I will lay it out. Opus Dei has a long-term vision. They have that long game. They know exactly where they want to go and what they need to get in order to accomplish it. They need to get young, influential, intelligent people so that they can mold them into the kinds of individuals that they want them to be. And these people, because of their backgrounds and where they come from, are already primed to move into very influential positions within their government and everything else once they are older and graduate from these schools. By that point, Opus Dei already has their hooks in them and is already kind of guiding their decisions behind the scenes. This all sounds so crazy and conspiratorial, but it is literally all right there. You don't have to stretch the imagination to understand that this is exactly what is happening. And then there is one final quote that I want to read from um, Gordon Erghart. He wrote a book called The Pope's Armada, Unlocking the Secrets of Mysterious and Powerful New Sects in the Church. And he said, Opus Dei pursues the Vatican's agenda through the presence of its members in secular governments and institutions and through a vast array of academic, medical, and grassroots pursuits. Its constant effort to increase its presence in civil institutions of power is supported by growth in the organization as a whole. Their work in this public sphere breaches the church-state division that is fundamental to modern democracy. I am of the opinion that religion should really not play a large role in government and the decisions that leaders make. Obviously, if a leader has a particular religious affiliation, that is going to color the decisions that they make. But when you have a religious organization largely influencing the decisions that a government is making, it can go south really, really fast. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church has been trying to influence governments for years and years and years. You can see that looking back as far as the Middle Ages, they were heavily involved in the decisions that monarchs made. I think it should stay out of the picture and be left up to the decision of the individual because it can really start to muddy the waters. If you think about it, that's partially how this country came into existence in the first place. People left England because of religious oppression and taxation without representation and everything else and came to the Americas to try to build a better society where people were treated more fairly and more equally, had more control over the decisions that they made. Looking at history, it just does not bode well whenever religion gets too big for its britches. And I think that is exactly what Opus Dei is trying to do. They want to control the course of history. They want to make the decisions. They want to be involved in these big key historical moments. And they have positioned themselves to be able to do exactly that. It's so huge, it's so crazy, but it is all right there. I think the part of all of this that kind of pisses me off the most is that, you know, if they want to take over the world and run everything, okay, fine. Plenty of other organizations and groups do, ones that we know about and ones that we have no idea about. It's not a new concept, it's not a new thing. It's the fact that they do it on the backs of good people who are just trying to lead holy lives and do what they think is right. And Opus Dei has snookered these people into believing that they have cracked the code for how they need to do that. And that if they just do X, Y, and Z within Opus Dei, they will go to heaven. But if they don't, and if they leave the organization, if they don't acknowledge their vocation, then they are doomed to hell. It is classic religious oppression. It makes me sick to my stomach. I think it is just so unnecessary. But by the same token, if you can convince a group of people that you have the answer, and if they leave, they're doomed, well, you have a captive audience and a captive source of income for pretty much forever. Opus Dei understands that and they are using that to their advantage. So that is where I'm going to leave this whole discussion for now. Like I said, there is plenty more and we are going to be coming back to it. But I think this brief overview of Opus Dei and the Vatican and their banking and everything else really tells us everything that we need to know. Opus Dei is not interested in leading people to heaven. It may have been at one point. I am not convinced of that because I'm not convinced that Jose Maria Escriva was just some great dude, but it is no longer the case. And they have a very vested interest in continuing to grow their wealth and influence day by day, bit by bit, as much as they possibly 
can. And so I'm going to continue to be talking about this. It's getting more and more and more interesting, so please do stay tuned. And you know, that's just a final note to those who think that I shouldn't be talking about this and that I am somehow misrepresenting a wholesome and good organization. I'm going to continue to tell the truth and present the facts. My goal is to just force people to pay attention to what is happening and maybe at some point down the line some young kid who's thinking about joining this organization who has a new numerary friend that's whispering in their ears maybe they'll come across one of these videos and it'll make them rethink their decision to get involved with this organization if i could accomplish something like that that would make all of this worth it and so that is where i'm going to be leaving this discussion for now. There is still plenty more to talk about, like I said, we will definitely be coming back to it, so please do stay tuned. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what your thoughts are. Give it a thumbs up, of course, if you enjoyed. Share it, and I hope that I will see you for the next video whenever and wherever that may be. Bye, guys.